more than 100 years of fire suppression, along with the effects of climate change, have transformed Western forests into a tinderbox. We're getting these ferocious fires that we've never seen before. The way the world is right now with these horrible fires, she's answering. The mother will answer back. And so the fire spirits are dancing out of control. Catastrophic wildfire is one of the greatest crises that we face. More than a million square miles of forest are now at risk across the West. More fire suppression and conventional forestry practices can't solve this problem. Private landowners and even governmental bodies like the Forest Service are looking for partners with innovative approaches. The only process that can be implemented on the scale that we actually need it today is fire. The Fire Ecology Restoration Project has been launched by the Permaculture Institute of North America. In the first year of the program, we trained motivated crew leaders in restoration forestry, an expanding field that needs thousands more skilled workers. Our unique permaculture-based approach includes the production of biochar, a process where excess woody fuels are converted into a material that can be stored in the ground for thousands of years, sequestering carbon that would otherwise escape to the atmosphere as a greenhouse gas. Biochar improves forest health by increasing the soil's ability to hold water and fertility. While the production process uses fire, it creates very little smoke thanks to a cutting edge, yet remarkably simple and accessible technology known as the flame cap kiln. We believe healthy and fire-resistant forests can be created if communities and people with a love of the woods are trained and employed in a nuanced ecological approach. The first step in this restoration work is to take an honest look at the history that led to our current situation. For thousands of years, these lands have been tended by indigenous communities who regularly set fire to the land and created a rich and diverse mosaic of ecosystems that were extremely abundant with plants and animals. These forests were incredibly robust with large insect and fire resistant trees. The long-standing relationship of Native people in this land that is Oregon now got interrupted by a colonial occupation about 150 years ago. And that was detrimental to the Native people here and also detrimental to the land and the actual functioning, complex, dynamic relationships of all the living beings. As you can see, you know, looking at the landscape, it's made a huge difference to not have the management of indigenous communities. And so with colonization and the genocide that happened and this extreme shift in land management practices because of the displacement of native people, the fire stopped and then the conifers come in full force and they grow up really quickly and overtop all these mature oaks that were here. And so then there's this conversion from oak savanna to dense conifer forest that is not actually totally adapted for this landscape. Oftentimes, conifers without fire become very dense, especially industrial plantations. It's one species, it's one age, the crowns are all the same height, and there's not a lot of spatial diversity. Especially with the intersection of climate change, these really dense forest stands pose a really great risk of catastrophic fire coming through and just devastating the stand and taking lives and structures. We've been excluding fire for way too long, and so we have this fuel buildup that when a fire does come through, we have fires that are much hotter and more extreme than they really should be. Some people say that fire is a disturbance, but actually not having fire be part of the landscape is the disturbance. Some of these trees, such as the madrone and the manzanita, are fire-loving. Their seeds germinate when they're heated up to a certain temperature. It's actually a part of their life cycle. We need to find better ways to adapt to the new reality that fire is going to be burning in the environments that we live in and in the mountains that surround us. A lot of our management practices are not working. It's not sustainable. It's out of date. 
there is a huge role for people to play in stewarding and restoring these lands. And if we do that in a strategic way and do it in close proximity to our homes and in so doing build resilience, I think we can start to reduce the wildfire effects that are threatening our communities. We need a lot of innovation and creativity. It's really about working with fire, not stopping fire on the landscape. What we've realized is that we need to be doing work in the forest that is going to help our forests become more resistant to the fire in the first place and more resilient when the fires do pass through. We do that by typically thinning from below, meaning taking the smallest trees out of the forest and leaving the largest, most fire-resistant trees. And by separating the crowns, we make it more difficult for fire to jump from crown to crown. And that tends to cause the fire to burn on the surface rather than in the crowns of the trees. Yes, we are killing certain trees. And when there's not active disturbance or human tending of the land, it can become out of balance really quick. The legacy of land tending here has been one of kind of leave it be, let nature do its thing. And what that has led to is a tremendous buildup of fuel. They call them ladder fuels. It's essentially what grows from the ground cover up into the canopy. And with fire suppression, it's allowed these fuels to grow up and become a major threat. So we're trying to reduce the fuel load and doing it in a rapid fashion, but at the same time trying to manage the delicate nature of the landscape. We have a lot of really unique plant communities, a lot of rare plants, a lot of endemic species that you find nowhere else in the world. And then there's also this blending of ecosystems here, which is really important to think about. Everything out here serves a purpose and has a role on the landscape. And I try to think about that as I'm doing prescription writing or implementing treatments. What we're trying to do is work with this landscape and work with the existing plant communities to make something that can be more resilient long term and can provide more benefits both to society and to the wildlife and the natural systems that they exist in. One of the beautiful things that happened today with this group is I walked with them and I asked to tread lightly because there's native medicines here. There's indigenous food that was once thought to be extinct in this region. The yampa still growing up there, the wild yampa. I've got wild carrot still growing up there. We've got the white oak, one black oak, you know, that's also our food. They're trying to heal the mother. They're not just gonna rip through and clear and clear cut. They're actually having a conscious mindset about how does it affect everything around it. They're really talking to the trees. They're looking at them. They're really analyzing that. Even though it does involve chainsaws, I do think that there is a gentleness to just helping offer a different pathway forward for the landscape to develop with greater care and ongoing management. Everything here is alive. Every stone, every blade of grass, every tree, everything is alive. And so when we do do the harvesting and stuff like that, we ask permission to take that. And are they going to fix it overnight? They know they're not going to fix it overnight because this took hundreds of years of neglect because we have neglected the earth. We are a part of a community that's exploring creative methods of restoring the land, and it's really exciting to be part of that. And in order for us to see true restoration of the land and functioning ecosystems for generations to come, we need to see true indigenous sovereignty. We need to see access and power return to current indigenous communities. My life's calling is to take care of the mother because that's what I was originally born to do as an indigenous person was to steward the land, the human beings. That's what we were put here for. There's nothing that seems any more obvious than the people who stewarded this land for 18,000 years know how to best bring it back to its real health. It doesn't mean that we want to take everything back. It doesn't mean that we want to borrow you from it. It means that we're asking you to respect and listen to what we have known for thousands and thousands of years. Stepping into doing this work while reconciling the history and all that's happened requires a lot of humility. I think it's an opportunity to practice staying open 
and curious and receptive to feedback as we learn. We don't have all the answers, and so there is a need to be spacious and take a step back. Luckily, I feel like there are a lot of opportunities where we can move forward with a pretty good degree of confidence in being able to make a decision that will create greater ecological resiliency, diversity, and habitat. There's middle-aged oaks that are growing up that have good crowns and that aren't overly crowded right now. Here's an opportunity where we can convert back to that really rare and precious native ecosystem. Yeah. Douglas fir and oaks haven't co-evolved to be in that tight of a spacing with each other. Normally, you know, fire in an oak ecosystem would be clearing out those seedlings. The decision making in this context would be to cut down the Douglas fir, even though the Douglas fir is healthy. I'm thinking about climate change. We're seeing like massive Doug fir die off in the Willamette Valley. The oaks seem to have a much more flexible range in terms of drought tolerance, flood tolerance, you know, heat, fire. And by having a native nut tree that's providing all this ecological habitat, I'm not having to purchase my nuts from somewhere else where a landscape has been completely converted from a native ecosystem to be a monoculture, not orchard. If I actually have an opportunity to have a direct relationship with a plant, like a mother oak tree, and I'm receiving the acorns from that, and then I go home and I know how to process those acorns, and then I eat them, and my body's receiving nourishment, it inspires me to then want to take care of that tree even more. Like, my love for that tree is just expounded <laughs> exponentially. And not only do I want to take care of that tree, I want to take care of the whole place where that tree is growing. and. I want to just spend time there and I've like started a relationship where I'm receiving something and then that inspires the giving back. These diverse forest ecosystems co-evolved with frequent low intensity fire managed by native peoples. Many leading experts believe we need to return broad scale low intensity fire to the forests, but in its current state the risks are just too great. First, we have to reduce the fuel load to create safe conditions for future prescribed burning. In opportunities like this, where there's a need for forestry, for fuels reduction, for thinning, there's this incredible abundance of biomass that is actually a huge fire hazard. And so the question is, what do we do with all of this biomass? And the conventional practice is to throw all the biomass into big piles and then burn them. And there are some problems with that. There's greater atmospheric pollution and the loss of all the carbon that's stored in that biomass. There's a great alternative to pile burning, which is the production of biochar using the same materials. Biochar, in its simplest sense, it's charcoal. When you heat wood in very low oxygen environments, it bakes into charcoal. And a really interesting thing happens to the material that makes up that wood, the cellulose and lignin, gets converted into sheets of a carbon material called graphene. And graphene has a cellular structure that's very difficult for microbes to break into and utilize. So a piece of wood that's down on the ground will rot over time and decompose. And the organisms that are breaking that down are breathing oxygen like we do and exhaling carbon dioxide like we do. So eventually that piece of wood, as it decomposes, turns into carbon dioxide that, as we now know, um, is contributing to, to climate change. It's a greenhouse gas. And so in order to keep that carbon from go going back into the atmosphere, if we pyrolyze it, if we cook it in the absence of oxygen, turns into graphene, which remains in the soil for centuries. We can actually retain close to 50% of that carbon and sequester it in a long-term way that also is good for the soil and forest. Turning that material into biochar, while is more labor intensive, is actually relatively easy to do and with the right technology and skills and training can be integrated into these forestry practices. We have developed a number of different styles of what are called flame cap kilns. These biochar kilns are simple, inexpensive, and produce very little smoke. 
They are safe and portable enough to be operated by small crews anywhere, from forested towns to rough terrain in the backcountry. We load the wood in the opposite way that you would build a fire. We load the large fuel on the bottom and put the very most flammable, finest fuel on the surface, and we light the top. As that flame covers the top, creates a flame cap, heated air that's rising pushes the oxygen away from the surface, and then air comes into the side to feed the flame. So the radiant heat from the top of the flame cap penetrates to the bottom of the kiln and heats up that wood, but we've got metal sides around there that keep the oxygen from coming in. I've been doing biochar kiln development for a number of years now, and I started off using very simple containers. What I have now is a more advanced design called the Ring of Fire Kiln. It's modular, so it can be anywhere from six feet in diameter to 10 feet in diameter. And it has an integrated heat shield, and that's the secret to the superior efficiency and functioning of this kiln. It makes a huge difference to have this portable kiln to essentially do a stage one of burning in a controlled and safe way so that this whole hillside doesn't just go up in flames. As that kiln burns down, as it's becoming more and more ash, we need to stop that process. We don't want it to combust. We want it to pyrolyze. So we quench the kiln. We spray the developing char with water so that we drop the temperature and stop the combustion process. And what we're left with at the end is a pile of char in the bottom of the kiln that we can then distribute back into the forest. And while it's in the soil, it has some amazing biological properties. Because the wood is just baked and not burned into ash, all the plant cell walls remain, and so it has a tremendously high surface area. All those little tiny chambers hold water, so it absorbs water and the nutrients in the soil stick to the surfaces, so it adsorbs those nutrients and holds them in the soil and makes them available to plants. So it's really a win-win situation. We convert the carbon into a form that won't leave the soil for centuries, and it improves the growth of the plants that are using that soil so that they capture more carbon. By excluding fire for so many years, we're depriving the forest soils of charcoal that they need. And that if you dig down deep into a forest soil, you'll see in the older soil horizons from 100 years ago, before we started excluding fire, there's a lot of charcoal. So we're just putting it back. What we're doing really for all intents and purposes here is we're making the equivalent of fossil fuel and we're putting it back in the ground. The use of these biochar kilns could be a game changer for the health of our forests, for the impacts of smoke on our communities, and for our ability to do this work. To get the forest from its wrecked state to this more open, fire-safe habitat takes labor. Once that work is done, however, maintaining these landscapes through fire or grazing is relatively simple. It's not that much work to come through and burn an area like this once it's been prepped. As we implement these new forestry protocols, we're also collecting economic data on costs and practices that will allow us to scale up this work. We have to look at the whole picture of benefits versus costs. We're helping the forest be more resilient and we're sequestering carbon, so we're working for future generations here. And mainly what we're paying for to make biochar is a little bit more labor. It means we're paying people. Fortunately, it's not a steep learning curve. You know, we need some basic skills like chainsaw. You need to know a little bit about your objectives on the landscape. What do you want to cut? What do you want to leave? Then when you go to the step of making biochar, you learn a lot of things that a firefighter would learn. So a lot of these skills are translatable for wildland firefighting. So it's really good work for wildland firefighters to do in the off season. So it's a year round career. So Pina is involved in trying to get that workforce trained, a quality workforce, a sustainable workforce, and a fulfilled 
workforce, I might add, because this is good work. This is the kind of work that's really satisfying. You step back at the end of the day, you look at what you've done, and you know that you've done something good. This is only a beginning. Our research findings are promising, and our grassroots efforts are laying a foundation for the coalition building and massive scaling up that the current crisis demands. In order to solve the problem of climate change, it's going to take a thousand little solutions. And biochar is one of those small solutions, but scaled up, it can have an enormous impact. The way we're going to scale it is really going to be based on creating a social movement. Once a flow starts happening, I think we create a kind of a fractal pattern of tending for that place. It takes a culture. If we can come back into relationship with these diverse, resilient landscapes where we're meeting our human needs and we're also keeping in mind the landscape itself, we could be making our living from healthy ecologies. The task ahead of us will require many hands and minds over many years. The journey begins with recognizing that nature, as stewarded carefully by indigenous communities, was able to maintain healthy and productive woodlands for millennia. If we listen to and honor the land, the science, and the traditional knowledge, proceeding step by step with care, we can build a new relationship with the forest that increases the well-being of all, trees and other plants, wildlife, and humans alike. Earth is really important to me, and the teachings of my elders are really important to me, and my grandchildren. I want my grandchildren to know what it's like to walk through the woods and breathe clean air and drink clean water. And so that's why I'm fighting so hard.